Welcome. We have a big crowd tonight. Nobody stayed home for the Oscars tonight. Dick said I should say that just to break the ice or something. Welcome to the 36th annual um, Winter Lecture Series, and this is the 2019 version. I'm supposed to introduce myself, says your self-intro. I'm Chuck Francis, member of the committee. We are sponsored by the Social Action Committee of this church, Unitarian Church, and also partnered with Ollie, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute program. You heard all this last week, so you can nap for two minutes. Uh, we're funded in part by the Humanities of Nebraska, so be sure and support them, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Two things that you need to know about the website, which is www.unitarianlincoln, all one word, dot org. First, all the lectures will be available on the uh, Unitarian Church website, usually about a week after the lectures are completed. Second, if there is bad weather or if you have a question about bad weather, we'll have a notice on the website so you know not to risk your life getting here. Same website. If the parking lot is full, there's parking across the street in the uh, Pius parking lot, and hearing assistance is available uh, if you need that, back at the audio desk. Hearing assistance is available if you need it. Okay. <laughs> that was better than the Oscars line. Um, the evening will be a lecture for about an hour, an intermission of about 15 minutes with cookies that are provided by the uh, Social Action Committee. And we would, uh, they're donated, but we would welcome your donations to fund the um, lectures for next year with a small contribution, it says here, or a large one, if you like. Please silence your cell phones, or we will subject you to maximum shaming if yours goes off. Next week's lecture is by Professor Sergio Walls from UNL, which will be on Mexico today and yesterday and today, Democratic Change and Transitional Challenges. So the lecture you came for is with Professor Jonathan Hiskey from Vanderbilt University very close to Music Row, he told me. At supper, we were talking about the uh, Ken Burns special on country music, and he's a real fan. So we were talking about some of the wonderful song titles that come out of that genre. He'll be talking about Central America and the decision to emigrate, which is a huge issue we read about almost every day. Root causes and elusive solutions. And I'll give a very brief background. John is associate chair and Director of Undergraduate Studies, Associate Professor of Sociology, um, Associate Professor of Political Science, sorry, Sociology is, and Sociology, okay, and Director of Graduate Studies, okay. Received his PhD from University of Pittsburgh, won a prestigious award from the American Political Science Association for his dissertation in 2001. He spent five years at the University of California, Riverside, um, and joined Vanderbilt in 2005. His research is on local development processes in Latin America during times of political and economic reform. Particularly, he's focused on developmental consequences of Latin America's unequal, sorry, uneven, unequal also, I guess, um, political situation, and has looked uh, at research in uh, uh, Latin America and lived there uh, a couple of times and has studied communities across Latin America. The author of articles in a whole list of prestigious journals. Most recently, he was a contributor and co-editor of a special volume of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science entitled Continental Divides. Nice catchy title. International Migration in the Americas in uh, July of 2010. So it's a real pleasure to introduce John. Please welcome him to our series. Thank you all for having me. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I was uh, reading somewhere that I think the inaugural uh, lecture series uh, um, back in 85, 86 was on Central America. So I think it's uh, appropriate to come back because I'm going to return to that time during this talk. Um, so I got a lot to cover. Uh, so let's get to it. All right. <laughs> uh, so here's a roadmap of what to expect. Um, 
I always like to start my classes with a uh, first day of class with a quiz. So I thought I would do it with you guys too. Uh, we're gonna have a map quiz. Um, and then I'll go over the data sources that I'm gonna use and uh, that this talk is based on. Uh, with immigration, I think it's important to, uh, to be clear that we want it to be a fact-based discussion of, of the issues involved. And so I want you guys to be clear about where the data I'm gonna show you are from. Um, and then we'll look at briefly at trends in, in U.S. immigration over the uh, past several years. Uh, I'm going to make the case that there, and many of you know this, uh, there's been a dramatic change in what's going on at the southwest border. And then we're going to look at sources of that change. Um, and then kind of U.S. immigration policy responses to the change. And then I'll end with some observations. So first, the map quiz. Okay, I won't, I won't ask you about the whole world, <laughs> but I will ask you about Central America. So you don't have to yell out any names or anything, but uh, let's see if this works. All right, so we know this one, right? Mexico. Uh, and then <laughs> that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Everybody always gets mixed up, right? So I am going to give you uh, a tried and true way to remember the map of Central America um, I taught that to my dear old mom of 88 years old, uh, and if she can learn it, trust me, any of you can. So here we go. All right. Better get extra help, never commit plagiarism. <laughs> okay. So Belize is the B, better Guatemala is the G, better get El Salvador is the E, extra help is Honduras, uh, Never is Nicaragua commit plagiarism. We end with Panama as plagiarism. No, no, uh, no statement there on Panama. But uh, so I, if you leave with nothing else tonight, uh, I want you to leave. And you better remember this. We have a, another test at the end of this talk. So <laughs> better get extra help. Never commit plagiarism. OK? Everybody good with that? <laughs> OK. And, I, the reason that this is important is that geography is, is actually very important in understanding what's going on at the, uh, with migration today. Um, even more so, I would say, in the past uh, six months or so, when several of these countries have been designated as, quote unquote, safe third countries, uh, where asylum claims can be processed. Um, and so that is determined uh, where you are returned is determined by the first country you cross through. So Salvadorans are going to be crossing through Guatemala. Um, Honduras, most of the action is going to be taking place in Guatemala. But um, the geography of, of Central America is becoming increasingly important in understanding the migration dynamics. Um, so next, data sources. Very quickly, first one is a little plug for... Vanderbilt University's Latin American Public Opinion Project. Um, we've been uh, doing a survey across all of the Americas uh, since 2004. And between 2004 and 2019, we have done 34 countries and 310,000 interviews, face-to-face -face interviews with people across the Americas. Uh, for the most recent round in 2018, 2019, uh, we did 20 countries. Some countries were off limits. Um, we did not go into Venezuela. We didn't go into Nicaragua for obvious reasons there. But um, so we interviewed about 31,000 uh, in the most recent round. These data are publicly available. So if anyone wants to analyze survey data on your spare time, uh, you can find it on the Laptop website. These are some of our grad students uh, doing pre-testing and surveying in the field. That's what the surveys look like. Um, so yeah, there, you, you will see some data from there. Um, you'll see data from Customs and a Border Protection, uh, and you will see data from uh, what's called the Syracuse Track Project. They look at the immigration court system in the U.S. and uh, the, the number of cases, the number of uh, uh, days that it takes to get adjudic adjudicated, that sort of thing. So you'll see a bit of that. Okay, so that's the data. Uh, what do the trends look like? Um, over the years. So this is apprehension data, the most common metric that is used in the US to um, uh, assess 
migration flows across the southwest border is the number of people we are apprehending, okay? So from 25, we have data from 1925 to 2019. And what you see here, uh, my circles are a little off, uh, but uh, up to 2018, um, the, uh, the level reached the lowest uh, it had been since 1971, okay? Um, and I'll show you another trend uh, in a second. Here's 2019, all right? So we see a significant, very significant uh, increase in 2019. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what's behind that um, in terms of a lot of our indicators of what's going to cause a surge like that do not indicate that that should have happened. Um, but it did. So uh, we can maybe talk about that in question and answer. Uh, this is from the year 2000 uh, to um, uh, 2019. And what you have here are uh, the two categories of apprehensions um, classified by CBP, uh, those apprehended from Mexico and those apprehended from other than Mexico. That's the category they refer to it as. Um, and what you can see and what, what you should take away from this is that migration from Mexico essentially is over, okay? Um, it was 1.6 million in the year 2000. Uh, in 2017, I believe, um, it dropped to 170,000. And for the first time in 2014, more Central Americans, you can see that little uh, spike there, more Central Americans or more other than Mexico uh, individuals were apprehended than those from Mexico for the first time in this period. But I mean, this is, this is a very significant change in what's going on at the border, is that the people showing up are no longer predominantly Mexican, okay? Um, the other than Mexico category, uh, um, oh, and I should say, so the estimated apprehension rate, right, so these are just the numbers of people apprehended, um, but we know that the apprehension rate has uh, increased during this time period. So we are catching more people, and from reports I've seen in the past four years or so, it was close to 90% because most of the apprehensions were actually self-surrenders where individuals would seek out a border patrol agent to turn themselves in to initiate an asylum process, okay? So if you consider this uh, increase in apprehension rates, these numbers, this decline in apprehensions is all the more uh, impressive in terms of the reduction in the number of people trying to cross our border, okay? Um, and pr you know, prior to <laughs> when I gave this talk in 2018, the takeaway was, you know, all of this talk about a crisis is, it, there is no crisis. This is actually, all the things that we've done over the past 20 years has worked, apparently, because Mexicans have stopped trying to immigrate into our country, okay? So what I'll get to next is what's going on, all right? Um, so this is the other than Mexican category, and as you can see, it, it passes 50% uh, in, uh, in 2014, and then skyrockets um, from uh, in, in 2018 and 2019 in particular. And this is simply just a reflection of what you saw on the previous chart um, in terms of the numbers. 90% uh, of this other than Mexico category are from three countries. Uh, there are individuals, if you look at the CBP list of uh, the countries that make up that category, there are Indians showing up, people from India, people from China, people from essentially every country in the world. There has been at least one person <laughs> that's been apprehended that falls into that category. And so you will sometimes hear, oh, isn't, you know, isn't all of Africa showing up at the southwest border and all this? Generally speaking, it's a Central American issue. 90% of those in the other than Mexico category are from uh, three countries, the three northern countries, uh, El Salvador, uh, Honduras, and Guatemala. In the next few slides, um, 
the colors will remain the same for the, these countries. So El Salvador is blue, Guatemala is red, and Honduras is, is green. Okay, just to, yeah, <laughs> you can't make out the legend. All right, so this is a lot of information. This is really just trying to convey what has changed about the individual showing up uh, at the border, right? So if we think of 2000, when 1.6 million uh, Mexicans were showing up at the border, I can tell you the vast majority of them were between the ages of 16 and 30. They were male, uh, tended to be single um, or uh, living with someone. Um, that has changed quite a bit in the past several years, right? And they tended to be, back in 2000, they tended to be driven by economic considerations. They were looking for uh, what the typical story is, that you, you kind of go north for a few years, earn some money, and then go back and, and start your life. That, that was, that's the story. I lived in Mexico in 97 for a year, and uh, that was the story you heard everywhere, is that's kind of the typical thing. That has changed. So uh, unaccompanied children, uh, these are the increases that we've seen. The data are not available back any farther. Uh, the big one is the family units um, for Honduras and Guatemala, right? And one thing you should see is that Salvador is leveling off uh, quite a bit. Uh, this is the other thing is that the, uh, the rates of uh, single adult apprehensions have basically stayed flat during this time uh, of great change. Um, what's happening is, and this is what you see in the, in the news, um, unaccompanied children and family units are kind of um, the main thrust behind the, the increase here. Uh, and then the gender component um, has risen to about one in four are, are female, okay? Um, so at Vanderbilt, at, with our uh, America's Barometer, since 2004, we've been asking people, do you have the intention to leave? The wor wording right, is right here. Do you have any intention of going to live or work in another country in the next three years? We found that this item tracks fairly well to when we model it uh, to um, models of actual migration behavior. So this, the same things predict who says yes to this question. It might seem to be a, a fairly noisy measure of, of migration, but it tends to work fairly well. And what I want to point out is that um, since 2012, particularly in Honduras, there was a spike in intentions. But what we've seen in 2016 and 2018, 2019 is a leveling off, if not a slight decline in these three countries with actually Mexico starting to, to creep back up. Uh, we don't see the numbers of apprehensions creeping up for Mexico yet. I haven't seen the 2019 data. I've read reports that there are more Mexicans showing up because of uh, violence concerns. But, um, I, you know, this leveling off, granted it's only for a two, uh, two years, um, but it's uh, certainly suggestive of things getting maybe a bit better in the near future. Um, yeah, so what has changed, just to summarize, prior to the 2019 spike, uh, we, were, we were in a good situation in terms of uh, illegal crossings. They were down to 1970 levels um, across the board. Um, and despite the increase in 2019, uh, we still see levels less than they were in the early 2000s. Um, the immigration intentions that I just said appear to have leveled off and the fundamental shift is in who's arriving, right? So no longer Mexicans um, and the, uh, more Central Americans um, and more women, children, and family units. All right, so that's just a real quick overview of what's, go what's been going on so you have some facts uh, about, about these things. So why, is th why have these things changed, all right? What's been going on? Um, so first we'll look at change in Mexico. Uh, very quickly to see why it has dropped so precipitously over the past 20 years. Uh, so this is a map of Mexico, and the dark lines are the railroad lines um, that in the 1920s, um, after we had kicked out the Chinese with the Chinese Exclusion Act, 
of, I believe it was 1924, we, we needed labor in the Southwest. So US labor recruiters went on these railroad lines and went down and recruited along the way. And I mentioned that because if you look at a map circa 2003, the dark areas are where about um, 65 to 70 percent of Mexican migrants come from in the U.S. Right? It is not a national phenomenon, and in fact, it's pretty uh, straightforwardly traced <laughs> to our labor recruitment efforts in the 1920s. Because migration, economic migration at least, is something that it's very easy to open the spigot, but it's much harder to turn that spigot off. Because once you start a cycle of migration, it becomes easier for subsequent migrants to make that trip. Information costs are lower, they know where to go, they know what jobs are available. Uh, and so um, this is where the bulk of migration was happening in that era that we looked at about 2000 when all, you know, many Mexican, Mexicans were coming, they were coming from, I spent a year in Jalisco and so know that area very well and it, you go to any town and the migration story was very, it's almost a ritual uh, of young adult males making the trek north. That has stopped, okay? Why has it stopped? Number one, uh, Mexico's economy, despite <laughs> lots of challenges, um, has actually done fairly well over the past 20 years in terms of growth rates. And in particular, those very same states that were sending all of the migrants were also happened to be the states that benefited most from NAFTA, okay? So NAFTA had very clear winners and losers in Mexico. The, uh, the whoops, I just turned it off. Ah, what did I do? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I meant to go back. There we go. So this area of Mexico got decimated by NAFTA. This area uh, grew uh, significantly under NAFTA, primarily because this is where many of the assembly plant operations were rel relocating to. So the, the area that was sending the most migrants was the area that was most helped by NAFTA, okay? And so with economic opp opportunity, migrants stopped coming, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, so that's the GDP per capita growth, uh, growth rate for, um, for uh, not growth rate, it's the GDP per capita for Central America, the three northern countries, and Mexico. Um, the second key component of why Mexico, Mexicans have stopped coming is that there are not as many Mexicans to come, right? Uh, if you look at the fertility rates, and my demographer friends will tell you, this is the entire story right here. Migration is a demography story because we know more than anything that once you get past a certain age, your probability of migrating drops almost to zero unless you are, your life is being threatened. But if for an economic migrant, you, you don't want to get out of your house after you've reached the age of 35 or so. So it's between 18 and 35 where most migration takes place. And uh, this is the US rate of about 1.8 in 2015. Mexico is down to 2.2. The replacement rate is 2.1, all right? So Mexico, in a few years, a decade or so, is going to be facing likely a, a labor shortage as well. Um, what do the other Central American rates look like? They're, they're there, getting there, but uh, so Hon Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. El Salvador's closest, and that comports in some ways with some of what we've seen from that country migration-wise. Um, and certainly uh, Gua Guatemala, uh, that's where the bulk of migration is coming from um, in recent years. All right, so that's change in Mexico. So there's a, a story on the Mexican side. There's also a story on the, the Central American side. Um, and this is a story I'm sure you all are familiar with. And, you know, I could certainly 
tell you some horrific stories uh, about what I've seen and heard, but uh, essentially the takeaway is that over the past 10, 15 years, violence and crime and violence and insecurity in the three northern countries has become unbearable for parts of their, those countries. Um, so these are the homicide rates, uh, reached a peak of 105 per 100,000 in, uh, I believe it was 2016 in El Salvador. Just to give you a base of comparison, the homicide rate in the U.S. is 5.3. The homicide rate in Chicago is 18.6 per 100,000. And we're talking about 105 per 100,000. Um, and people, when they talk about, oh, well, the homicide rate is dropping in El Salvador, why are they still coming? Uh, well, it's dropped from 105 to 65. So, you know, this is a case where uh, it's, it's hard to know when it has dropped enough to, to matter. Um, and I will say, Guatemala is a, a slightly different story than the other two countries. Uh, Guatemala, the, the, uh, the gang issue and the homicide rate has always been um, lower. And in our modeling of, of these intentions, Guatemalans have always appeared to be a bit more economically motivated than what's been going, in, go, going on in Honduras and El Salvador. I like to make that distinction because it, it, for us at least, it became clearer and clearer that what was happening in Honduras and El Salvador was not an economic story because of how much it stood in contrast to what we were seeing in Guatemala, right? Now, things may have changed. I, we've yet to really dig into the 2019 data, so we don't have a good sense of what's going on there, but um, in the past uh, 12 months. Um, this is the femicide rate uh, in these countries. Uh, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Um, again, it's not surprising to me that um, Honduras and El Salvador are so much greater than, than uh, Guatemala and Mexico. Um, in our surveys, we asked people, what's the most significant issue facing your country? And this was 2014 data, and you know, no surprise, El Salvador and Honduras, again, kind of stick out because close to half or more than half uh, say that crime uh, is the country's most significant problem. Um, here, this is the, so we asked people, have you been victimized by crime? We'll look at that in a second. But the percentage of people reporting that they have been victimized by crime categorized by what type of crime. And this is telling, again, because Honduras and El Salvador, uh, armed robbery and extortion, I will say, extortion is the most pernicious type of criminal activity going on in these countries today. And that, from what I've heard, read, seen, that is what's driving people. Uh, getting, uh, when you're going to work every morning and you cross through a gang-controlled neighborhood where there is no state presence whatsoever, and a 10-year-old kid is at the border of that neighborhood and you have to pay him a dollar or you risk your family's life or your life, and it's a daily occurrence for residents of these areas that if you pass through a certain area, you pay the bully the, the dollar. Um, I, you know, there's, I was in Honduras talking with uh, uh, directors of various agencies there. One of them, we were talking about the decline in homicide rates, and he was saying, well, you know why it's declined? Because everybody knows what the deal is now. For example, and he proceeded to tell me the story of a gang member now can walk into a high school, any high school in, in this part of town, go into a classroom unmolested, point at a young woman, point to the bathroom, rape her, the young girl comes back, sits down, and the class goes on like nothing happened. And that's the low-level equilibrium they have arrived at. And, when, and that's where the extortion element comes into play. It's just constant, every day, in your face. It's not like you were mugged or you know, your house was robbed. It's, it's just a constant cutting away of you know, what, it, what it means to have a life. Um, and we have all sorts of indicators of this uh, dynamic going on. And my sense is that that's what underlies the decision to risk your life to try to go somewhere else. Um, 
So here's, uh, we uh, looked at immigration intentions, that item I showed you before, across uh, categories of respondents. So these three categories are, uh, you've never been victimized, or you have not been victimized in the past 12 months, is the wording of the question. Uh, you were victimized once, and you were victimized more than once. And what you see is that in Mexico and Guatemala, to a certain extent, there's not that much difference. Um, I mean, we would expect victims of crime maybe to think about immigration more seriously than non-victims, just in all else equal. But when you look at El Salvador and Honduras, the story there is that this kind of constant, th th these multiple victims, 50, over 50% 50 of them want to leave, right? And, and I'll get to part of the difference. Um, well, I think it's here. Yeah, so we looked, so just as a base of comparison, Mexican crime victims, and this is just all, anybody who said they were a victim, Costa Rica crime victims, and Honduras crime victims. So what, look at what's happening in this chart. You have, uh, and this is the percentage of people victimized who say they want to leave, okay, who have immigration intentions. So all of these countries are about the same. Honduras is a little higher back in 2004, but declines. And then they have uh, a coup in Honduras in 2009. Um, there's a complete loss of confidence and faith in the government in Honduras. And the, it spikes. The immigration intentions of crime victims spikes while those in Costa Rica and Mexico stay about the same. And the story uh, that we are kind of getting more evidence for is what happened in Honduras was not just the crime victimization. It's the absence of the state and the lack of confidence in the state to do anything about it. Because when you think about immigration, you're looking at the long-term horizon because it's a very difficult choice to make, particularly these days. And so if you have any glimmer of hope that your government is going to step in and do something about it, you don't leave, right? Chileans who get mugged or extorted or whatever, they're not leaving Chile, right? Costa Ricans are not leaving Costa Rica. Hondurans are leaving because of this combination of constantly under threat in, this, in a context of no government help. And oftentimes, the... Uh, P agents of the state are on the side of the bad guys, right? Uh, they are the, uh, on the payroll of the gangs who are controlling these neighborhoods. And so you have nowhere to turn to. And it's that loss of hope that I think is driving a lot of these people. Um, we're doing, this is just a, a little promo for the really recent hot off the press research that I've been doing with a colleague of mine we're looking at crime victim, victimization rates among people who re receive remittances in these countries. So remittances are the money that is sent back. And what we're looking at, because having lived in, and done work in high migration areas, one thing you notice is who's getting money, who's getting the remittances. Typically, they have a satellite dish on their house, or there is some type of indicator that that's a remittance household versus a non-remittance household. And so I started hearing stories that gang members were uh, specifically targeting remittance households. So we wanted to see if that kind of was borne out in, in our data. And what we see is that what you have here, the, these are respondents who receive remittances. These are the ones who don't. And it's going across a uh, neighborhood the extent to which gangs have identified themselves in this neighborhood based on graffiti on the walls, right? It's a measure that we use. Uh, so remittance recipients are a little more likely to be targeted when there's no gang presence. But when there's a gang presence, the gap is, I mean, this, this impact or this effect really astounded us that it was so substantial in terms of the probability, the increase in probability of remittance recipients of being victimized by a crime. Um, and so you have this very troubling uh, story of family of migrants sending money back to help his family. And in, in the act of doing that, they're putting them in more danger. 
And what the end of that story is that these people in this area, are their immigration intentions are through the roof, right? As you might imagine. So it's kind of, it becomes a very vicious circle in, in terms of that. Um, all right, so that's, that's what's changed on the Central American side. There have been some kind of fundamental things that are different. I mean, there's always been violence, there's always been crime, but uh, <laughs> uh, things are different. Um, all right, so let's look at US immigration policy and how they've responded. <laughs> I might give it away there, one size fits all. Uh, so there's a bipartisan uh, strategy underway under Obama and Trump, similar in, in underlying strategy, perhaps a little different in um, how far they've carried it out, but uh, basically it's a deterrence policy, right? If, if we can only convince them that they're not gonna get in, they won't come. That's the premise of US policy with respect to Central Americans. So Jay Johnson, the Secretary of Homeland Security, if our message is we will send you back. And if only you knew that we were, you have spent seven th several thousand dollars, we'll send them back and they will have wasted their money. And then there was a dangers awareness campaign that produced this billboard in, uh, in El Salvador and Honduras. <coughs> Then that was followed by a Know the Facts campaign with uh, media uh, launched in Central America telling people, don't come, it's dangerous. And when we did a survey of people asking them, do you know, like, what is your perception of migrating to the US? 85% said, it's dangerous. We have very little chance of getting across. Um, our, uh, the journey is less safe than it was last year. We put that in a model of immigration intentions, none of those things matter, right? They know it's dangerous. They know their chances are small, but they're coming anyway because of what I just described to you 10 minutes ago. Um, and, you know, the, one of the punchlines of this talk is that deterrence on that subset of migrants just simply does not work. It may have worked on economic migrants, on the young Mexican male. Yeah, I don't want to be detained for, you know, two years, uh, maybe I won't go. It, as far as I can see, it's not working on this, this population. Uh, Border Patrol budget has skyrocketed, uh, fencing, you know, all of this is not new. We've been talking about walls in, in one form or another for years. Bush put in 600 miles of walls, fences, whatever <laughs> you want to call them. Um, the, uh, and we've turned to Mexico for help too. Obama um, uh, uh, enticed Mexico into helping us after the 2014 crisis. And lo and behold, Mexico deports more and apprehends more than the US for the first time ever of, in 2015. We enlisted the help of Mexico as the Admiral uh, Gortney, head of the US Northern Command said, I think my dollar would be better spent partnering with Mexico. So, these, the solutions we're seeing, or the responses we're seeing today, they may be couched in a little bit more aggressive rhetoric, but the same basic strategy has been around for quite some time. Um, the asylum policy, and this is where, you know, I will make somewhat of an argument. I would say, we, we, to the extent that the people arriving now are not economic migrants and are closer to the refugee category, whether they qualify or not, they're closer to that end of the scale. Um, I would say we have a history of not being able to deal with asylum seekers in our country, despite all the best talk. So the Refugee Act of 1980 um, said that, you know, the historic policy of the U.S. to respond to the urgent needs of persons subject to persecution in their homelands uh, provide a permanent and systematic procedure for the admission to this country of refugees, right? Um, and have you, the definition of refugee is there. Um, and not more than a year or two later, of, after passage of the Refugee Act, um, we find ourselves in the midst of a civil war raging across Central America. So U.S. has had a long long history in, in Central America. Uh, we've backed dictators. We created Nicaragua's National Guard. 
Um, we overthrew Jacobo Arbenz, the democratically elected president of Guatemala in 1954. And if you don't believe me, the, the documents have been declassified. We did it. Um, and that sparked a 40-year civil war in Guatemala that killed over 400,000 people. Okay? So we have a, our hands are dirty in this region. What happens in the 80s? El Salvador finds itself in a civil war. U.S. is sending massive amounts of military aid to the military government, right? Fighting the leftist commies that are, uh, <laughs> are going up, up against their military dictatorship. You got the Guatemala civil war going on. Um, in Nicaragua, we have the Contra war. So here, the U.S. is aiding the rebels trying to take down the uh, Nicaraguan government. Um, and Honduras serves, we remember your map, get extra help, <laughs> never commit pleasure. So Honduras finds itself right in the middle of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua, serving as a perfect US military staging area for all of the conflicts that are taking place, okay? So essentially dragged into the conflict as well. Um, all right, there's aid, aid to Central America. Um, let me try to speed up. The, the immigrant crisis, as you might expect, all of these civil wars spark a refugee uh, outflow of people, and they're fleeing for their lives, uh, and they go to the US. So what happens to them? We have our refugee policy in place, right? We're going to grant them all uh, asylum. Well, uh, sec Assistant Secretary of State says, we think the majority of these people are economic migrants. That was in 1983. Um, but then Reagan, <laughs> in 1984, says, and in all of Central America, more than 800,000 have fled. Um, concerns about the prospects of hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing oppression to seek entry into our country are well-founded. So he is calling them refugees. But his Assistant Secretary of State is calling them economic migrants. Um, so you have this decades-long battle between lawyers, the ACLU, churches. There is a, a significant church sanctuary movement during this time for these refugees. Um, and members of Congress were pitted against the Reagan administration over what do we, what do we call these individuals fleeing their civil wars? All right, well, they came up with two answers. For Nicaraguans, they called them asylum seekers. 87% of Nicaraguans were granted asylum in 1987. The asylum rate, app approval rate for Salvadorans and Guatemalans, less than 3% during this period. Wow, why could that be? <laughs> because we were supporting the governments in El Salvador and Guatemala, we were opposing the government in Nicaragua. So we have, uh, you know, and it's not earth shattering, we have a history of using asi the asylum process, not for what it's designed, but for the political objectives of the particular moment in history we find ourselves in, okay? Um, and this is bipartisan. All right, so these are some of the court cases, just to back up, uh, permanent injunction in the Orantes Hernandez versus Mies uh, includes lengthy findings of fact regarding human rights violation by the government towards Salvadorans. A uh, substantial number of Salvadorans who flee possess a well-founded fear of persecution. Uh, and see if this sounds familiar. The widespread acceptance of voluntary departure is due in large part to the coercive efforts of, and of the practices and procedures employed by INS. So what they were doing was the same thing we're doing today. We're telling asylum seekers, you need to go back to your country. You're not going to get asylum. Uh, the, uh, this is, um, oh, pointer's not working. Um, prior to the issuance, INS agents directed, intimidated, or otherwise coerced Salvadorans within their custody who had not expressed a desire to return to El Salvador to sign their voluntary form, departure form, right? 
exact same thing that's going on today. <laughs> um, this, these were the other court cases that upheld, and I want to point this out. So the final ruling in this case was that INS had to go back and reconsider 250,000 asylum claims that had been filed during the 80s because INS was not doing it the way the law said they should. They were telling them to turn around. All right, so this is not, what we're seeing today is not, uh, not new. Um, and it's not partisan. Bush, when Haiti had a military coup, Bush picked them up at sea and put them, sent them back to Haiti or put them in Guantanamo. Clinton did the exact same thing. The point is that we have always talked about asylum one way and we've dealt with it in a very different way. And that will come back to bite you if you're not careful. And the next part of this is, um, so what the story is, we have hundreds of thousands of Salvadorans and Guatemalans and Hondurans to a lesser extent in the US in the 90s and 2000s. Unauthorized because they did not receive asylum, their kids start to grow up in Los Angeles, Chicago, other major cities without legal protection. If you're unauthorized, you're vulnerable and you go underground, and you don't report crimes, you become an underclass, right? So this failure to deal with asylum created a significant underclass of unauthorized individuals from these three Central American countries. So what happens? We start deporting them once they break the law. So the kids, the 1.5 generation of these refugees that were never called refugees uh, start to form gang, gangs. So MS-13, uh, uh, 18th Street, they formed in Los Angeles to protect themselves during the 1990s and early 2000s from the Bloods and the Crips and the other gangs that were already established in these areas. And then as soon as 9-11 happens, we say we need to get every immigrant, unauthorized immigrant, out of here if they broke a law. And the easiest population to target were the Salvadorans, the Guatemalans, and the Hondurans, the kids, the teenagers who had broken laws by being members of gangs. So we started sending them back in mass. Actually, Clinton started it in the late 90s. Um, but it, it kind of accelerated under Bush. Um, so expedited removals um, and deportations uh, started to increase with a specific target of these uh, young, usually male, members of gangs uh, in these large cities. Put them on a cargo plane, land in San Salvador, open the doors, didn't even tell the Salvadoran government what they had done. We just kind of pushed them off the plane and said, they're your problem now. And this was happening in the early 2000s. So is it any surprise that we have a gang problem in El Salvador in 2020 or 2015? Um, these were sophisticated, by this point, these were sophisticated gang members going back into their home country where no, there was only just these little minor gangs and they quickly were able to recruit a significant population. Um, so I'm almost done. I'm about five minutes over, but uh, <laughs> of what I promised these guys. Uh, but I'm almost done, I promise. So, so wh what, are, what have we done to respond? Remember, the one size fits all. Um, this is our, and my slides did get kind of messed up. This is called uh, the Executive Office for Immigration Review, uh, EOIR is essentially the US immigration court system that you often hear about. That's its official agency title. And these are pending cases, as of 2018, 768,000 cases that have yet to be finally adjudicated. Um, the average days to final adjudication, 718. So if you want to detain these individuals for 718 days, somebody have a calculator? 
I can tell you what detention costs. It costs $153 a night. All right? <laughs> Ankle bracelets are $17 a day. Uh, and they're about 90, uh, over 90% effective. <laughs> um, and then the immigration court judges, 395. They're, they're working on it. You can see what, uh, what happened under, um, uh, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> There's been an effort under Trump to uh, increase the number of judges. Um, the funding, that's where it increased under uh, Obama. Uh, with his crisis, um, so that's $428 million. Let's compare that to CBP and ICE. Uh, so <laughs> combined budget for CBP and ICE is over $21 billion. Uh, the combined budget for, get ready, FBI, DEA, Secret Service, U.S. Marshals, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the Executive Office for Immigration Review was $17 billion. So they still got us beat by $4 billion. Uh, this is uh, CBP. This is ICE. And oh, yeah, here down here is EOIR in millions, <laughs> so 0.4 million. Um, so and now we're, I think we're kind of revisiting the 80s in terms of trying to essentially just pretend that we don't offer asylum to anyone. So we're making them stay in Mexico, these safe third country agreements. No, you can't get asylum here. You have to go back to the first country you cross through. So that's Honduras. And because they say they have an asylum system, they must have an asylum system, even though they're the fourth most violent country in the world. Um, and if you don't like there, you can go to Guatemala. They're the only the sixth most violent country in the world. So you might have some good luck there. Um, we're doing metering at ports of entry. Uh, so some of these are, at least in my untrained lawyerly eye, the clear violations of things that we have on the books. But uh, so far, they've gotten away with them. The one th and the most recent that I've seen is this severe tightening of the credible fear interview process, um, which is the first step for asylum claims. Um, and that's, you know, that's where they can really because it stops any, anything else. It allows for deportation if you fail your credible fear interview. So, and there's been a lot of pushback by asylum officers who are understandably upset because they are the ones doing these interviews and they're being told you cannot approve the, uh, so many. And the only reason they're approving them is because it, it's up to them whether this person goes back and is potentially killed, right? So they're the ones that are making the life and death decisions but being told by somebody else, you got to decide this way, not that way. Um, and then you know, most troubling for the asylum system as a whole internationally is if you look at what Europe is doing, if you look at what Australia is doing, I would argue it's just as bad, if not worse. So uh, in Europe, the EU essentially sent hundreds of millions of dollars to Libyan warlords to prevent people from uh, getting on boats out of Libya to make the cross again, uh, the make the trek across the sea, um, Australia is probably the most egregious in terms of trying to uh, limit asylum claims and stop people from stepping foot on their soil because that's the thing. If you step foot on your soil, you know it's hard not to begin an asylum process. Um, so the first plan of attack for all of these areas is don't let them step on our soil. Let them step somewhere else. Um, my, you know, what we're doing here is sticking our head in the sand because none of this, it may work in the short term, but it's not getting rid of the problem that we talked about 20 minutes ago. Uh, and these are certainly not gonna help. <laughs> so closing observations, um, I, I basically said all of this, but the current arrivals is, are not what we saw in the past. They are like demonstrably different in terms of the motivations, the socioeconomic characteristics, uh, the demographics. It, it's a completely new situation than what it was in 2000. Um, and our policy, 
hasn't really changed. Um, the, that policy is designed for economic migrants, not forced migrants. Uh, the links, you know, just took a trip back in time, just kind of look at the links between what we do in other countries and what happens 15 years later. And I think there is a link. Um, you know, it's hard to pin down empirically, kind of get inside the heads of, of all of those young teenagers, but um, certainly uh, it seems to have contributed. Um, and if you want to know, kind of one quick example, why aren't there any Nicaraguans crossing the border, the southwest border? Well, plausibly, again, I don't have empirical evidence, plausibly, it's because we granted Nicaraguans asylum back in the 1980s. So those were families that were able to have a legal foothold in American society, not live underground. Their kids could go to normal high schools. Their kids could not be, could turn to the police if approached by gangs. They weren't confined to uh, certain areas of town where, uh, you know, immigrant police didn't, um, were, didn't come. All of these things, the advantages that you get when you become legal, I think we see a little um, bit of what happens down the road when we look at Nicaragua, right? Um, and then new policies uh, for new migrants. I mean, I wish I had better answers for you, but I don't. Um, the kind of standard, I, you know, I think funding for the EOIR is an absolutely essential next step. We need to get our immigration court system up to funding levels, you know, somewhere close at least to ICE and CBP because that's where the action is for this new type of migrant. Um, development, trade, uh, and regional cooperation with the Central American countries. I, I th I'm a proponent of that, but with, with trepidation because the current governments there are so friggin' corrupt. Uh, and it's, it's easier said than done to say, let's help d them develop. And I, there's good organizations on the ground. Most of it's tr going the NGO route, trying to run around the governments um, to try to get development going in these countries. But um, it's a really difficult uh, problem to solve. And it takes political um, kind of will to do something that only has payoffs 5, 10, 15 years down the road. It's not a sexy political uh, solution. And then finally, um, you know, recognizing this for what it is, which is a regional uh, refugee crisis, and bringing in the UNHCR, the UN organization in charge of refugees, enlisting the help of South American countries, although they are caught in, a, in their own refugee crisis with, I uh, last count, uh, 5 million Venezuelans have spread out throughout uh, South America, so they're dealing with a similar situation, uh, more gracefully in many respects than we have. Um, but you know, approaching it with a regional uh, focus, I think may may do some good as well. And with that, um, remember, <laughs> okay, <laughs> Guatemala, that's Belize. Better get <laughs> extra El Salvador help, Honduras. Never Nicaragua, yeah. commit <laughs> Costa Rica, and <laughs> plagiarism, Panama. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>